Welcome to this episode on the Health and Happiness Show, where it's my mission to change your mindset so that you can live a health and happier life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Let's go. Hey guys, it's Ollie here, and welcome back to another episode on the Health and Happiness Show, where today I am joined by an incredibly special guest. She has a background in traditional media training, working for the BBC, plus presenting on RTE, followed by having worked in Italy for Irish distillers on brand marketing for Bushmills and Jameson Whiskey. Reading up on this lady's background was impressive. And then it gets even more so, as today she is the founder of multi-award winning Belfast Fashion Week. Sin here right now makes me feel a little bit inferior because I have zero fashion sense, um, but she has a number of big business accolades to her name. This follows the founding of CMPR in 2004, which focuses on PR events for consumer goods, primarily lifestyle products and services, and more recently, CMPR. The long list of business accolades and achievements continue as today's guest is also the founder of the fwords.com and creator of the original blogger brunch. In other words, she's a busy lady who has so kindly given up her time to be on the podcast today. The reason though why I was so eager to get this guest on the show wasn't to spend the next 30 minutes about fashion. She would need to give me at least three hours on a masterclass. Instead, I want to dive deep into her skill set and mindset as a business leader and leading voice for women empowerment, which after watching her TED talk inspired me to get her on the show to hopefully inspire you, the listener at home, to pursue your passions in life and settle nothing but the best. Last but not least, this lady is a mother to her wonderful daughter, Valentina, who is the spit image of you, by the way. <laughs> so it is therefore with great pleasure and excitement that I welcome and introduce the show, Kathy Martin. Kathy, how are you? Wow. Do you want to rewrite my LinkedIn bio? Because <laughs> that was amazing. Okay. So you have just wrapped up a nice little trip in Rome. Tell me, what was the best highlight? Well, I used to live in Rome. So when you mentioned I worked for Irish Distillers, I lived in Rome. Um, well, I lived in Italy back from 1997 until the very tail end of 1999. So in the millennium um, and then came back. So I was working there um, in brand marketing for Irish Distillers, um, specifically on the Jemison brand, a little bit on the Bushmills brand, to at that time take Irish whiskey out of the Irish bars and into the kind of trendy bars. So that was amazing. Um, Italy was booming at that time. Um, and never once in that whole time did I see the city as quiet as I've just seen it post coronavirus, post pandemic. Um, and so the best part of being in Rome just now was actually to see it with a completely different set of eyes in that it was not fully deserted. I mean, it wasn't ghost townish. There were still tourists there, but just to have, for example, the Trevi Fountain all to ourselves to take photos, um, albeit at 2 a.m. And then even on the Piazza di Spagna going up the Spanish steps, we were able to do pictures with the actual steps because normally they're covered, you know, top to bottom in people. That was really nice. That's amazing. So obviously one of the large focus areas that I wanted to you know, talk about today was your TED talk. Um, at the TED Talk series themselves inspire me. It's where I get a lot of my learning from. I just find them so valuable to watch as part of a mindset series. Um, your talk was inspiring to say the least. And given that there'll be a lot of women listening to this, I thought this was really going to be quite valuable for them today. The title of your TED Talk, I believe is pronounced Pole Pole. Mm -hmm. um, for those who aren't aware, what does this mean? Where does it come from? And how can we apply this to our lives? So, um, let me just roll back a little bit. Um, the theme of that TED event was um, momentum, gathering speed, and you know, and building up. But I actually flipped the title or the theme on its head because I kind of said, no, 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 let's slow down, let's think, let's make our moves with some thought and structure. Um, and I was telling part of the TED talk was to give a little anecdote about climbing Kilimanjaro, which I haven't done, by the way, but just telling a story about people who climb Kilimanjaro and the local, um, mostly Swahili speaking guides um, will try to tell everyone to slow down because Kilimanjaro is such a massive mountain. And it's one of those ones that you hear people getting really bad altitude sickness with from. So, um, pole pole means slow, slow. So it's kind of easy, does it slowly, slowly. It's all of those things. Um, and the guides would very often just, um, try to tell everyone to slow down because, you know, in, in doing things slowly and a bit more methodically, you get to achieve your goal a little bit better. And so 
that was one of the anecdotes that I had told. And I kind of really liked the Pole Pole um, uh, name just for my, the title for my TED talk. Um, but there were a lot of other personal examples that I gave about, you know, really stopping and sometimes forcing myself to stop or being forced to stop um, to allow myself to take stock and to make decisions about moving on. And I think, you know, we're in a pandemic and um, it's still not ended. A lot of people have been forcibly stopped to do what they're doing, whether that was working really hard, whether that was, you know, drinking really hard in their personal lives or over exercising or overeating or, or whatever they were doing. If some people were doing things to excess, which weren't necessarily good for them, the pandemic has given us an opportunity to really stop, take stock, see what we're doing, and then maybe think about moving forward in a slightly different direction with a little bit of thought and a little bit of time, um, which I know is your, your favorite subject, with a little bit of time on their hands um, to, you know, to press the pause button and to make some decisions with, with a little more clarity. So how do you slow down then, you know, in such a fast paced world and given how busy you are in your jobs and whatnot and, and to be a mother, how do you take that time? How do you find that time? What does that time look like for you? Well, I mean, this pandemic has kind of ripped away a lot of my work. So one of the biggest parts of my businesses is events. So, you know, I Belfast Fashion Week is one of my businesses. We can't do Fashion Week because we can't have gatherings of no more than 30 people um you know and the other part of my business is cmpr talent so the one part of cmpr talent is the model agency so you know model work is just starting to come back and starting to trickle in but you know that's very it's very difficult to have models in a photo shoot situation where there's lots of changing going on where makeup artists and hairdressers are touching their face and their uh, and their skin and their hair um there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of tactile kind of things, even stylists dressing them and stuff, you know, that can't happen, certainly the way it did before. Um, and it's just starting to, I know a few makeup artists and stylists and, and model agents are getting together now to create, you know, best practice how to do that. So that work's gone. So fashion week's gone and events have gone and the model agencies, uh, model agency work has gone. Um, I've been doing a little bit of copywriting and press releases and stuff that's kind of what I started off CMPR doing and I love writing and I love reading so words are my thing um so that's okay um and then doing a little bit of influencer marketing with um, myself and also with some of the people that I represent um so that's the only part of my business left that's been that's, that's working which kind of pulled the carpet from underneath my feet um thankfully I had a little bit of money kind of put aside which has helped to do things like pay the mortgage you know um i am very grateful and, and lucky to live in a nice house but you know these things cost money bricks and mortar cost money whether you're in a two up two down or whether you're in a bigger house so yes i've been forced to stop the pandemic has really affected that and being forced to stop is for me just as good as you know other times when i've slowed down i'm like no, right. They don't come very often. I did slow down and I did stop when I was working really hard. I mean, 14, 15, 16 hours a day. And then I ended up um, losing a baby that I, you know, I was pregnant with. And, and I lost El Rosie um, when she was born premature and, and stillborn. And um, so that kind of forced me to stop. And in her birth, then, you know, I got sepsis in, in childbirth. So, I mean, there was a risk of me losing my own life and when doctors kind of you know tell you that this is going to happen or tell you that you know your life is at risk and you need to do stuff it kind of you know puts the brakes on for you so that happened made me think then Valentina came along and whilst I was a stepmom before I had three lovely kids um having your own child is slightly different I'm not going to say it's better I mean it's wonderful but like I, I really was close and thankfully still am close to the to Valentina's siblings as well um so all of that, you know, I think being a parent and dare I be so stereotypical and maybe even sexist to say be, being a mom really kind of changes um, your perspective on life and your mindset. So I think all those things together made me tip my work-life balance definitely more into the life side of things than work. And whilst work is still important, um, things like working on online working, for example, have allowed me to, you know, make decisions and work differently. So I can work remotely, I can work at home, I can be anywhere in the world and successfully do a lot of what I do without actually being present. 
So a lot of my friends and you know colleagues and peers who are who find working from home really difficult at the beginning, just trying to readjust. Um, you know, I was able to advise them and, and say, you know, actually, once you get into it, it's a lovely thing. And if you discipline yourself enough to not, you know, watch Netflix and chill all night or all day or to like stuff yourself full of food and go to the fridge every five minutes, once you discipline yourself a little bit into that and give yourself, you know, that kind of chunks of time to get things done then it's fine. Um, I use the Pomodorino kind of, um, or Pomodoro, I call it Pomodorino, Pomodoro method, which is basically, you know, you set yourself 30 minutes um, and it comes from those old American, I think they're American, you know, tomato timers. Um, and, you know, in that 30 minutes, I will get this done. And even if those 30 minutes are doing the laundry or, you know, because I think it's healthy when you're working from home to take a break to go and do the laundry or like tidy up the breakfast dishes. Some people don't. Some people think they'll do all of that before they start their work day. But I just think, you know, get half an hour, 45 minutes work done and then go and do that for 15 minutes and then come back, fresh mind, brain ready and start it again. 100%. He hearing you speak is really fascinating because it's allowed me to understand your mindset. And even there, you just sharing how, for example, losing your first daughter, I can only begin to imagine the pain. And actually, I want to quote you because in your TED talk, you said, you know, you spoke about adverse, adversity. And again, to quote you, it, you said, adversity can either make us bitter or better. It can make us or break us. It can make us the victim or the victor. It's your choice and only you can decide what to make of your own diversity, whatever that might be. So my question to you then would be, how have you overcome those pain points in your life, losing your first daughter, the sepsis, and probably every other challenge up until this point, how have you overcome that? I don't think there's a conscious kind of formula that I use, um, but I'm just not really, um, I think when I come from a big family, so when we talk about mindset and where that mindset comes from, um, personally, I believe that I think and do what I think and do because of who I am and where I come from. So I come from a big family. I've got six siblings. I'm number six out of seven kids. Um, my parents weren't super well off and they worked really, really hard and pretty crap jobs um, at the time to literally make sure that we were educated and go through um, school. And mom and dad always really pushed us. And I suppose being one of the younger siblings, um, I got pushed by my siblings and was encouraged by and inspired by my older siblings as well. And I'm sure there was probably a bit of competition there too that I wanted to, you know, I needed to do as well as they had done. Anyway, um, so we, you know, we as a family were, um, we were quite academic. Um, and, you know, we didn't do loads of extracurricular activities because we couldn't really afford it. And I'm not doing poor me here, but actually in those days, we're talking kind of, um, late 70s and 80s here not not many people did that kind of stuff um, so I think that again there's an attitude in my family just get up and get on like just get on with it so if you fall and scrap, scratch your knee you know it's just like get up and get on you know my mom had seven kids to worry about and I think she knew that in the grand scheme of things uh, uh, scratching your knee wasn't that important um, and wasn't kind of life endangering and so you kind of learn through a, some kind of osmosis or something that, you know, smaller things don't really matter too much. Um, and, you know, I think my mom went through a whole load of stuff with each of us in different ways, um, through crappy partners or whatever. Um, you know, then she, just seeing and learning how she coped with things. My mom was actually quite religious. Um, so she probably had a strong faith and maybe that got her through. But I think for me, um, I always just always have I've always just seen the best in things mm. and you know so I remember even getting the newspapers from my parents every day when I was probably about second or third year. And we used to get the Belfast Telegraph and the Irish News every day. And I think there was like literally 5p change. And I do that every day and I saved up all those 5p's. And at the end of, I mean, seriously, my school year, I'd saved up enough. And then I wanted to go on a French exchange and I was able to say to my mum and dad, like, I've saved, and it was probably only about 60, I don't know, 60, 70, 80, I don't know, but it wasn't very much. And I was able to say, I've saved all of this 
Um, so can I go on a French exchange? And then I went on a French exchange and none of my family had ever done this to go and live in France with a family for three weeks and then have a French girl come to our house. Um, and I just kind of said, no, I'm going to do that. I, I want to do that and I'm going to do that. And I did that. No one else in my class even did it. Um, and I think um, I just kind of said, I want to do that. I picked what I wanted to do and then I just made it happen. So even though... I didn't have loads of money and, and whatever. And actually, when I got there, I remember I knew loads of French vocabulary, but actually the, the dad started speaking to me and using verbs. And I was kind of like, what on earth is he saying? Um, but actually, thrown into the deep end, I just rolled with it and got it. Um, maybe you don't want to hear this. Maybe that's, maybe that's not period shame, but I got my first period when I was there, for example. And it was the dad who took me to the pharmacy to get me sorted out. I told my mum this when I got home and she just thought this was the craziest thing ever. Um, also, one day we were going to the beach and I couldn't figure out why no one was putting on their swimsuits and getting ready. Anyway, got into the car, went to the beach, got to the beach and literally I saw everybody's dangly bits going, we'd gone to a nudist beach. The family were just <laughs> nudists. And, that's, and it was a very natural and a quite common thing in France. So again, I came home and told my very Catholic mum this and she was just like, Oh my God. Um, I think she prayed for me. And at that time you had to bring your film in to develop it in the chemist and then get the photos back. And when she was picking, the, we were picking the photos up afterwards and there were pictures of my French friend's mom's boobs. Mom just thought this was the most mortifying thing ever. Anyway, all of that just relates back to me saying that I did this really crazy different experience when I was 13 or 14 years old. And I just went for it. And I think having done that so early and it, having been a success it just really allowed me then to choose the next thing I was going to do and then it was a success and then you know I got I had my brothers hand me down jeans for example but I went to what was craft world and I bought loads of buttons and fabric paint and whatever and then I started painting just the back pockets of the jeans and then you know this was the 80s so we had men's jeans and then tied them in really tight with the belt so they kind of look baggy um but I then had stuck on all these diamante bits and whatever on the back so it was pretty much like Madonna like a virgin era so then I I, I kind of used my creativity to do that and I don't know I think I just I loved being a little bit different but loved it wasn't that I sought out to be different for a different sake. I just kind of thought, well, everybody else is doing this and I come from a big family and I'm just, this is what I would like to do. And then I chose what I wanted to do and I kind of made it happen. And I got my first job when I was about 14 working in a shop. Um, and that was me. I haven't stopped working since. I mean, literally until the last few months, I haven't stopped working since. I think there's so many different angles that go with that. Um, one, you know, the the lesson there of patience and consistency, collecting all of those little five pence coins. I think that's so valuable um, because today we are in this instant gratification world, which I guess would be a good angle to go down, given perhaps you know your influence on social media um, and obviously raising a young daughter as well. What are maybe the it's a concern, I guess, you know, the mental health decline that is arising. Um, from social media usage and obviously inappropriate usage as well. How do you, you know, with so, so much time being spent on social media and that era of things, how do you, you know, manage that in terms of your mental health and your mental well-being? How do you not let, you know, uh, the opinion of others or your opinion of others, that comparison game, get inside of your head? And what are you looking out for in terms of your daughter's sake as she's growing up in this, you know, social media world? So... I love social media. I'm a social person in real life. So actually social media is just for me an extension of that. If you're not a social person in real life, then social media can be a difficult place to hang out. So um, I really like it. I enjoy it. I use it for positive, positive things. Um, I use it to connect with people. And my only comparison is inspiration comparison. So I'll say, look at that person's done. Oh, amazing. A bit like, you know, back when I was a teenager. So again, just, you know, comparison for me is a good thing but only because I'm in control of that comparison and I um you know I run a model agency for example so I see girls who are like 18 to 25 years old who are five foot ten who've got awesome bodies and I'm not I'm 46 years old I'm curvy and I've got a tummy I could get really depressed looking at their images all the time but I know I 
I, I'm not competing with them and I've come to a place of acceptance with who and what I'm, I am and whatever. And I'm healthy and that's important and we can talk about health after. But, you know, I think social media, if you, if you find someone's content is making you angry, unfollow if you find someone's content is making you feel crap about yourself unfollow i mean it's so easy i don't get why people um it's it's like back in the 80s i used to there used to be a program on bbc where people would write in to complain about tv shows and it's like why are you watching them yeah and then complaining so you know i don't get why people and there are a lot of people who watch stories, including my stories, to hate. I mean, thank God I don't have, I've got one guy who keeps changing, um, who keeps creating fake accounts to send me the no. same stupid messages all the time. And I'm just like, I'm going to keep blocking you and you just keep going, whatever, you don't bother me. And some people would say, kill them with kindness. No, 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 no. I say kill them with blindness. I don't even see you motherfuckers. You know? Oh, I'm using that. <laughs> yes. So, you know, <laughs> Like, you're so unimportant to me, you and your negativity, like, get the frick out of my life. Um, and I used to be a kill them with kindness person because I'm a real empath and I always wanted to have, you know, I wanted people to like me. But actually, now I've come to a point where I do just kill them with blindness. I don't even see you. You and your negativity are so unimportant to me because I know what's important to me. And what's really important to me is, first and foremost, my family. Second, my friends. Third, my business life, but not in a, I'm so obsessed with work way, but actually a lot of what I promote in the businesses that I choose to work with are businesses and brands that I love and I'm passionate about anyway. So, um, and that's why I can choose to love them. And I think, again, talking about mindset and people not being happy in their nine to five, Monday to Friday, well, mostly I think the problem is that they're not happy with what they're doing or they don't, they're not really feeling it. So for me, in choosing your career path at any stage, whether it's, you know, way back, back at the beginning, or if it's like me down the line and you're ready to pivot, you know, it should, you should be choosing what you like and then finding a job within that industry or brand or company and, you know, getting yourself in there that way. It shouldn't be, I'm just going to work nine to five so I can do my hustle in the evenings at the weekend. I get that. And that does work for some people and that's a necessity for other people. But like, don't kill yourself doing your nine to five, Monday to Friday, hoping the hustle will come good. At some point, you have to take a risk and you have to jump and you have to go with it. And if it fails, you know, three weeks or three months down the line, you know what? Go back to the, go back to the day job. Think again, you know, uh, and reassess. Yeah, no, I think there's so much value in that. Um, again, it goes back to almost, you know, when you're saying when you're growing up with your brothers and whatnot, and, you know, if you'd fall over, it's a graze on the knee, get yourself back up, pick yourself back up. And I think we are in this very snowflake society today um, where we need this sort of wrapping up in cotton wool. And again, I think this is a really good sort of resilient mindset that you have. So just talk me through maybe what, you know, uh, some of the practices that would look like on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, are you a fan of meditation, yoga, exercise? What do you do to clear the head, to make you feel strong? So um, I only just started meditating through lockdown, actually, and someone invited me to join a WhatsApp group on Deepak Chopra's 21 Days of Abundance, which was amazing. And then for one of the final tasks on the, on abundance, uh, medita on the abundance meditation is that you have to create another group and then you kind of go through the 21 days with them. I've now done it four times and I absolutely love it. Um, and it's really good. And actually, a lot of people do it first thing in the morning. I quite often do it at night. So Deepak's lovely voice, he's got this really beautiful accent. Um, and he, um, my favorite one is day 16 or 17, I think it is. And it's, he's talking about gratitude. Um, so I quite often fall asleep to Deepak Chopra talking about gratitude. And if that isn't going into my mind, I don't know what. Um, I do think I'm grateful anyway, in general. I think I've always been really grateful for anything and everything I've got. I come from a family that we had to share everything. So anything I got for myself, whether that was me working for it myself or being gifted or whatever, I think gratitude is so important. So I meditate. The other thing is that I work out most days. Um, some days I feel it more than others. Some days I lift heavier than others. Um, I don't aim to be bodybuilder physique because I love food too much. Um, Same. <laughs> and like, you know, I just don't want to be that person that just drinks protein shakes and eats like dry oatmeal and really tasteless food. I love lashing butter onto, okay, it might be a sea bass and it might be spinach and other greens, but you know, 
that plate will be, you know, have plenty of butter on it. So I love food and eating for me, especially eating with other people is, in a social way is a really nice way to kind of switch off. Um, and of course, we're all, we all grab and go all the time. And when you arrived, I was eating a banana with Nutella. Um, so I, I think for me, health is really important too. So meditation, working out um, and health in general. Um, you know, I'm very, very conscious about what goes into my body. And that does include crisps and chocolate and whatever the odd time. But I'm, I'm, I'm not crazily um, strict on that. But, you know, um, I kind of like intuitive eating. So when you eat what your body kind of is craving for, but not OTT. Um, and I think food's a really important part of life that we don't give enough notice to. I think people in general eat far too much processed stuff. I think I, I truly believe sugar is a killer. Mm -hmm. I believe sugar is the king of inflammation and the cause of inflammation. And I believe inflammation is um, inflammation is the cause of most disease. And you'll know having had cancer, you know, cancer thrives on sugar. So, you know, and as you get towards my age, you know, you start, have to start thinking about your heart, your liver, your lungs and, you know, your brain. So Alzheimer's is massively um, contributed to by over dosing in for want of a better word of sugar um so i'm really quite um i'm really quite careful in a balanced way about food and that's important to me and that is part of me relaxing i love having people around and i've loved since lockdown has eased a little bit where we've been able to have um friends in the garden i've loved having people around this table um and you know enjoying company so and what else do I like doing? The other thing I like to do is read. Um, so I kind of got out of the habit of reading a lot when, I, when Valentina was born and then young. And I only really started picking that up again in the last year or two. Um, I mean, reading online is so easy when you've got a phone or whatever. Um, but I've made a really conscious effort to get back into actual books. I like a book in my hand. Um, and I think that's another way to switch off. Um, like I said before, I've got so much more time in my hands and that I'm not frantically working all the time so I do all of those things a little bit more than I would ordinarily do um, and I think I'm really zen and really chilled at the minute and lockdown has been lovely for me there is a financial worry you know where's the mortgage going to come from um, I'm not working enough to kind of sustain the lifestyle I had before um, but like a lot of people I have learned what's important and it's really simple things in life. I want to know what does Kathy Martin struggle with? Hmm. What do I struggle with? I mean, at the minute I'm struggling with not having the same volume of work I have before, mm. if I'm honest, you know, um, I've, whilst I love lockdown for all the simplicity that it brings, I actually do really miss the pace of, of solving problems. So what I like to do is solve people's problems. Um, and I hope that doesn't sound arrogant. I mean that I, no. I literally really enjoy someone saying to me, right, right, we've got this or we want to achieve this. And then I'll come up with the ideas and say, right, let's do this or else advise and say, you should do this. And I love that problem solving part of what I do. And it doesn't really feel like work to me. I suppose, again, because I choose the companies that I work with. Um, so I have, um, the question was, you know, what do I struggle with? So I'm struggling with not having as much work. So bring it on, guys. I mean, literally, I can write. I can answer phones. I can do anything. Uh, so I do struggle a little bit with that. Um, but not so much that I'm banging my head against the wall because I'm sort of thinking, right, it'll come. And the other thing is I haven't proactively gone out there yet and said, Right, what do you need? Who needs me? Um, thankfully, in my whole working career, I've never needed to. Everyone's always come to me, and that's a really nice place to be at. Um, and if I have to, I will. And like, I'm not, I'm not proud. I'll do anything. Like, I'll sweep floors. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll clean toilets. You know, if I had to, I would. And I think again, that's an attitude that maybe some people don't have. That they have to be prepared to do everything. So even when I have events. You know, I'll be down cleaning a stain on the floor just as quickly as anybody else. And, you know, I won't expect my minions to, to do that for me. And I think that's a really good example to lead. Um, back to the question of what I struggle with, though. Um, I think 
I struggle with hate. Um, I don't mean directed at me because thankfully I haven't had a lot. Um, I, I've watched a few of my friends, those with online profiles and not, um, be a victim. And again, you talk about that cotton wool world. I think there are a lot of victims out there. But this is being properly victim to hate. Um, and it's I just don't understand it. And I know I shouldn't spend time trying to understand why people hate. I mean, essentially, I think they're really sad inside. And I always think that, you know, mad is a cover up for sad. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I struggle with other people's hate. I can't understand why they have to, their hate has to manifest itself or be projected onto another person. Um, you know, I, I can't do that. I, I, I always try and I'm a big champion of feeling the feelings. So whether that's anger or whatever it is, um, you know, I, I try and process them. And for me, a lot of time I will journal my feelings and I have journaled pretty shitty experiences in the past, some published, some not, um, you know, and like, I just, for me, that's a great way to get those feelings out there. Um, like an ex of mine who cheated on me multiple times and including with prostitutes and whatever, you know, I wrote about that and, um, you know, that really helped me, um, really pissed him off, <laughs> but I took it down. But, um, but, you know, I don't understand, I don't understand why, I don't know, different people process things in different ways. I just don't understand. And I'd love to understand how to process hate better. There yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm really passionate, obviously, about the mind and the psychology of the mind. And even, you know, with my health, like, I took a real interest in learning about the brain and actually studying the brain because it's the brain which is the master controller for everything right so like i'm like and there's correlations right what you spoke about today the exercise the meditation the journaling there are correlations to who you are as a person as a result of those decisions and those activities mm -hmm. and it's the same for the people who have gone the other way who go down that aggressiveness or that hate or just that narcissism and it's just not nice but it's usually a result of the poor f foods the inflammation which even they're not aware of so it's do you believe everyone can be helped everyone can change i think you have to want that for yourself mm. um i do think you can change but i think you know i know people who've been through struggles with alcohol for example and you know i tried to be the em empathizer and then i tried to be the tough love kind of a friend and then you know it's really hard to know what to do because actually that those people have to get to a point um, whereby they have to either, and it's a cliche, I know, but either hit rock bottom or just suddenly somehow decide that they need help. And that's a really extreme example talking with, about someone with an addiction. People with day-to-day -day crap behavior, for example, who just take that out in other people. Um, sometimes I think... Um, people can wallow in their hate and their anger and it's not that they necessarily enjoy it but they don't know any different so I don't want to sound like a psychologist but like you I love reading about it so reading about childhood trauma for example mm. and the effects that has on people you know way into their 40s 50s and 60s and I'm fascinated because I'm at that age now where I'm in, you know I'm surrounded by people who are going through again a cliche midlife crises but you know um it's it's usually midlife crises or manifestation of childhood trauma and it's so incredible that we can suffer things as little tiny kids and then they don't come out again until we're like in our 40s um and usually they're manifested through crappy relationships bad bad behavior um addictive addictive behaviors or you know going the other way and really shielding yourself and shying away and not being social at all so um i'm fascinated by it like you yeah what does happiness mean to you do you know what um happiness to me and i've been asked this before happiness to me is um being on a beach and i don't mean just lying there in a bikini sunbathing i mean like hearing the sound of the water feeling the breeze of nature yes. enjoying the sunshine on my skin um, you know, being with Valentina and or other members of my family or friendship group. And then what I also love and what brings me so much joy is eating together at the table, 
in the sunshine you know that to me is happiness and yeah i know i said i don't really drink but maybe having um maybe having a glass of wine 100 percent yeah. white or red yeah <laughs> both rosé in the summer <laughs> together <laughs> yeah fantastic okay before i ask my final question so where can the listeners find out more about you and your work so my website's been under construction for about six months only because i can't really decide what to do there because i have lots of different businesses um got a fair idea but anyway um but me um i live mostly on instagram so on the daily i put up instagram stories of what i'm doing whether that's behind the scenes or whether that's kind of worky things or whether it's just personal stuff i do share a lot but i suppose people think i share everything i don't share everything i still have lots of private personal moments um and so i'm at kathy martin 10 on instagram so that's instagram.com forward slash c-h-h-y-m-a-r-t-i-n one zero um and yeah that's where i kind of hang out but i'm everywhere as in i've got a youtube channel haven't really been on it much recently i'm on linkedin um i'm on facebook but i don't really use other social channels as much as i would use insta very good and i will put all of your details in the show notes my final question then what is the one thing the listeners can do that would have the biggest impact on both their health and their happiness eat healthy food um i would say um eat mostly vegetables um what is that expression eat food mostly plants not too much i can't remember the name of the author who wrote that um i follow medical medium on um on instagram i also follow alpha foodie um so i i i just think um food is a really still massively untapped part of mm. our mental and physical health and i think that will we will grow to learn and understand that a lot more 100 percent, i couldn't agree more kathy thank you so much for your time this has been amazing until next time guys stay healthy be happy take care